Hi, everyone, and welcome. It's great to have you joining us today for this conversation. Uh, my name's Carolyn, and I'm staff here at EcoJustice, and I'll be your host today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm joining this call from Vancouver, which is located on the unceded, unsurrendered, and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I can see that people are continuing to join us. And so as more people are uh, sort of logging on, I wanna take a moment to make sure that this is an inclusive space. And um, so I'm gonna give a brief orientation of the online platform that we're using. On the right of the screen here, you'll see an image of the control panel. And I'll just go over a couple of the features, starting with the grab tab. Uh, so this is the orange rectangle at, um, with a white arrow inside and it's at the top left of your control panel. When you click on this, it will expand or minimize that panel. And with the panel open, you'll see your two audio options. You've got computer audio or phone. And when you click on the circle um, beside your preferred audio option, it's gonna switch between the two. And then finally, I want to point out the question box, which you can use to submit comments and questions at any point during the conversation today. Uh, we will have time at the end when we'll be taking questions uh, for our speakers, uh, but please you know, feel free to send your questions along um, as you think of them. And maybe I'll just flag also that this question box uh, doesn't function like a chat in that the other attendees won't be able to see what you're submitting. So if you'd like to go ahead and test the feature, I'm always curious to know where people are joining us from today. Um, so if you wanna type in and let me know where you're calling from, that would be cool. Okay, we've got uh, some people from London, Ontario, Toronto, Edmonton, Lake Huron Watershed, Regina Treaty 4 Territory, Victoria. Wow, we got folks from across the whole country, it looks like. Um, Pickering, Gravenhurst, Ontario. Well, welcome to everyone, including folks from Montreal. It's uh, really great to have you here with us today. Um, I think that some of you might be new to EcoJustice, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about who EcoJustice is. Um, our mission is to go to court and to use the power of the law to defend nature, combat the climate crisis, and fight for a healthy environment for all. Our team of experts, which includes lawyers and scientists, is backed by a very large and growing community of supporters, so people like you, and it's thanks to your support that we can share our expertise to ensure that community groups, Indigenous communities, and everyday Canadians, those people that are on the front lines of the fight for environmental justice, get their day in court, and importantly, are heard by decision makers. And that's a really great segue into our conversation uh, today about this history-making youth-led climate lawsuit. And I'd like to introduce you to our guest moderator, Emma Lim. Uh, Emma is a climate activist and you might know her through her work with the No Future, No Children Pledge of which she is uh, the founder. And this pledge has been signed by thousands of young people who have vowed not to have children until the Canadian government takes the climate crisis seriously. Uh, welcome, Emma. I'd also like to welcome Shailen Wabagijig and Zoe Curie-Matzner. They are two of the seven young people who launched a charter case against the Ontario government for its failure to take action on the climate crisis. Welcome. And finally, and with immense pleasure, I'd like to welcome my colleague, eco-justice lawyer Danielle Gallant and Spencer Bass, who is a lawyer at Stockwoods LLP. Uh, so the two of them are members of a talented legal team that's been uh, assembled to represent these youth applicants. So I think that uh, this is a really great 
moment for me to hand things off to you, Emma. Um, I will join you all in a little while. Oh, Emma, I think you're okay. muted. Uh, yes, sorry. I was I was not able to unmute myself for a second there. Okay. So before we get started, I ask these amazing participants some questions. Uh, I just want to give a land acknowledgement. So I am coming to everybody from Montreal, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Ganyagahaga, um, a place which has long served as a meeting site and exchange site amongst many First Nations, including the Mohawks of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, the Abenaki, and the Anishinaabeg Nations. Um, okay, and so my first question is going to go to our applicants, uh, Zoe, Kiri, Matzner, and Shaylin. So, why is it so important for you to be a part of this case? Um, should I start? Um, it's important for me to be a part of this case because um, it's my future, and we're in a climate emergency, and this is going to affect my future and all my friends' futures. So I felt it was, it was important to really stand up and fight for our futures. And also because there's so much like wonderful life on our planet and it's the only known life in the universe. And so we just keep destroying it with climate change. And the Ontario government has let so much more CO2 into the atmosphere. So they keep contributing to climate change and we cannot let that happen. So that's why it's important for me to be part of this case. Miigwech Zoe, Shailen Wabagishik and Dijnikas Atik and Dodem. Nenon de Wazawen Tmiskaming, Germany and Ireland and Donjaba, Mijikaning and Donjaba, meanwhile, Nogojuanang and Dida, and Nishinabe Kwe and Dao. So I said, hello, my name is Shailen Wabagishik. My clan is the Caribou clan. Um, my family are from Tamiskaming First Nation, Germany and Ireland, and uh, I grew up in Rama First Nation, which is called Minjikaning, and I currently reside in Nogojiwanong, which is also known as Peterborough, Ontario. Uh, and uh, this is a traditional territory of the Michisagi Ganeshnabeg, covered under Treaty 20, and they also traditionally share it with the Chippewa and the Ojibwe, covered under the Williams Treaty. So uh, with that, I want to say that really it's important to me to be part of this case. Um, what really struck me is uh, with climate change that um, the caribou are endangered and my clan is a really important part of who I am. And the clan system is our hereditary governance system and it outlines my responsibilities to my community and to society in general. And uh, this climate crisis threatens woodland caribou. And so in my traditional territory and also across Canada and a lot of other animals and without strong government action, uh, as Zoe said, the caribou and uh, a lot of other wildlife are disappearing. And if the caribou do disappear, then so will this part of my identity. And I believe this case will put pressure on the government to really help protect wildlife for future generations. So I'm a part of this case for all future generations of all species. And I also fear for my future and know that we have to act now before it's too late. Regret. Thank you both. And, and yeah, I think like those trends of like really caring so much about your future is, is why a lot of us are involved in that. And um, I mean, I wish that we could see that reflected in the way that our government is act, acting. And just the idea of like the fact that you both care so much about what's around you and your future, I mean, that drives activism. But from a legal point of view, um, Spencer and Danielle, how have you put that kind of drive uh, to be a participant in this case into the legal terms? What are like the main arguments you're making in this? Ah, oh, there you go. Does that work? Great. Wouldn't be a webinar without a little technical glitch, would it? 
Um, thanks so much, Emma. I, I can start with a bit of context uh, on why uh, what this case is about, and then maybe let Spencer get a little bit into the, the legal arguments that we're bringing in the case. Um, first, I wanted to mention that I'm located in Ottawa on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation, and I'm so thankful to call such a beautiful place home and for those who have taken care of this land for millennia. Um, in terms of the context of the case, the government of Ontario previously had three legislated targets for the reduction of greenhouse gases, or GHGs, um, that were relatively ambitious in addressing the climate change. However, when Doug Ford was recently elected, he enacted the Cap and Trade Cancellation Act, which, aside from the action uh, implied by its name, uh, also scrapped these targets and mandated that the government set a new one. And when Ontario did, it set a singular target for 2030, which significantly weakened their ambition on climate change action. Um, this target is not only uh, not in line with the imperative to reduce GHGs in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, it goes against the threshold that is recognized um, internationally in both the Paris Agreement as well as the scientific consensus described by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, also known as the IPCC. So in summary, um, this case is about Ontario replacing its previous targets with one highly inadequate target at a time when all governments have to do more to address the climate, the climate crisis. So I'll let uh, Spencer set out what that means uh, for our legal arguments. Uh, thanks, Danielle. And, and just before I get into it, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm in the city of Toronto right now, which sits on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And so to pick up on what Danielle was saying, uh, the main arguments that we're advancing in the case is that the Ontario government's inadequate target will contribute to the devastating impacts of climate change and therefore violate the constitutional rights of the people of Ontario. So as a result of Ontario's target, Ontarians will be forced to face the catastrophic impacts of climate change, which will seriously threaten their health and their ability to make fundamental choices about their own lives. So these impacts threaten the constitutionally protected rights to life, liberty, and security of the person, which are protected by Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, and in addition to that, because the effects of climate change will be felt most acutely by youth and by future generations, uh, those who will have to live through the worst of these impacts, Ontario's target also violates the equality rights, which are protected under section 15 of the constitution. So because of that, we're asking the courts to declare the, the target unconstitutional and require the government to actually adopt a target that protects the rights of the people in Ontario. Thank you very much. And, and actually, um, Spencer, I, I understand that this case has recently had uh, a historic and, and landmark victory. Do you mind explaining a bit about what happened and, and why that was so important? Yeah, definitely. So we filed the application in this case uh, back in November of last year. And rather than responding to the merits of our claim or setting out the def its defense, um, Ontario filed what's called a motion to strike and essentially they were asking the court to summarily dismiss our application before we were even able to bring forward evidence or make our arguments on why Ontario's greenhouse gas reduction target is violating constitutional rights. So Ontario was arguing that the court simply could not decide the matter and that the case was doomed to fail so there was no point in even letting us get any further. And so Last month, Justice Brown of the Ontario Superior Court decided the motion to strike and she released a 55 page decision which completely rejected all of the government's arguments. She found that uh, Ontario's inaction on climate change is properly reviewable by the courts uh, and that the claims set out in the application have a reasonable prospect of success. Um, so what that means is that we will actually get to move forward. We'll get to have our day in court. Uh, we'll get to bring forward our evidence and show the court how Ontario's emissions and the government's failure to institute a proper reduction, greenhouse gas emissions reduction target is undermining the constitutional rights of youth and future generations in Ontario. 
Um, so because of this victory, it means that a court for the first time in this country will actually have to consider this evidence and rule on the constitutionality of Ontario's inaction. Thank you very much. And, you know, just as someone who isn't directly involved in the in the court case, like hearing this news is is really inspiring and it's really impressive to, to watch this unfold. And so I have a, a positive question now um, to Shailen. Uh, you know, how would the world look different if you win this lawsuit? What do you want to see in, in a future where you have one? Um, well, if we win this lawsuit, then that really means that we have a chance at securing a, a safe climate and future a future for Ontarians and uh, for all future generations. So um, we are in a climate emergency, though, and like we can't solve this with the same thinking that got us there. So I would like to see a systems change in how we think about the natural world, how we relate to it. So to view uh, nature not as resources and capital, but as our relatives, which they are. Um, and I would like society to reconnect with the natural world and really cultivate good relationships with the land around us, including the incredible animals that give, the, give us so many gifts, um, the waters that give us life, and you know the plant life that are our food, our medicines, and that clean our air. I would like to see humans treating our relatives with gratitude and respect um, and setting targets that are based on legitimate climate science and, and uh, indigenous knowledge and science instead of short-term political agendas is a really great step in that direction. That's what I would like to see. Thank you, Shailen. And, and yeah, I agree that's so important. And I, and I mean, just the, the amount that we've emitted, the, the current state of things really goes to show that the way we are acting as a society is not sustainable. And, and you know, we have to make changes now before it's too late. And so, I mean, you guys are instrumental in, in making those changes. Um, and so this next question goes out to Zoe. Um, you're one of the youngest people on this lawsuit. And so I just, I wanna know, what's it like to, to be involved in this case? What's it like working with the other clients and the lawyers? Um, you know yeah um it's really it's really great it shows me how like i can make a difference in the world and in terms of the other the other panelists and the other lawyers um if everybody's just so sweet they're all so nice um it's also really nice to be part of a team especially a team that cares about climate change so much so yeah it's really awesome Oops, I just muted myself. And as a follow-up, do you have any like funny anecdotes or stories you'd like to share with us? Um, sure. I just remember after we launched the case, we went to dinner together at this big table and we played this really silly game where we all just went around complimenting each other. And that was just really sweet. Everybody is just so nice. I can't, it's, it's awesome. And those like post campaign, like group dinners and get togethers are like so important um, to keeping up spirits and stuff. And I'm glad that you have those memories. So this next question goes out to the lawyers. Um, we've heard from the, the youth and, and now I'd like to hear from the, the lawyers. Why is it so important to represent young people in this case? I mean, couldn't this case have been brought with adults or climate scientists instead? Can start us off there, uh, Spencer. Um, I mean, I think that there's obviously implications from the legal side, but um, I'd like to to highlight the fact that it's important to recognize that climate change doesn't affect everyone equally. Um, it'll disproportionately impact certain parts of the population, like communities and individuals that are already vulnerable and mar marginalized. Um, and as Spencer mentioned, uh, youth and future generations will be particularly affected by this because they'll, they'll bear the biggest burden while having contributed the least to this problem. But it's important to recognize that climate change also differentially affects Indigenous peoples, elderly individuals, and, and people with uh, pre-existing health conditions, to name only a few. Um, so, so it's important to highlight the fact that it, it won't affect everyone equally. Um, and I also think that climate climate cases should strive to give these individuals uh, and communities a voice uh, so that these disproportionate impacts can be taken into account by governments, by courts, and by, by the public uh, when we think about climate change and the action that we need to take to, to go forward. 
Um, so in this case, you know, youth have been leading the movement at a global level for climate action. So it, it makes sense to bring this case on their behalf and to continue to amplify their voices uh, in the courtroom and outside of the courtroom. Yeah, and, and I will just echo what uh, Danielle was saying that for us, it was it was very important to ensure that uh, the people who will be most impacted by climate change's devastating impacts, if nothing is done, were front and center in this case and that the court was actually able to hear from them in reaching a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer and Danielle. And and Danielle, you spoke about you know how incredible these youth are. So I would like to just take this opportunity to highlight a, a bit about what they're doing. Um, we'll start with Shaylin and then go to Zoe. Do you guys just want to tell the audience a little bit about how you're working to combat the climate crisis and and what you do in your every? Yeah. Uh, so really, I do what I can when I can, um, as much as I can. And uh, I also work at a charitable organization called the Kawartha World Issues Center, also known as QUIC, K-W-I-C, uh, which is a grassroots charitable organization that is a global education and resource center that facilitates conversations about world issues to enable people to engage in positive social and environmental change. So I hold one position as the program and outreach coordinator and another as a project coordinator for a one-year project. And that is the goal of that project is to advance the UN's, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, particularly the 2030 Agenda in Peterborough and the Kawartha. So we are focusing uh, on advancing four of those SDGs, and one of them is climate action. So um, that that whole project also takes into account prioritizing Indigenous knowledge and leadership, and leaving no one behind. So um, that's really exciting. That's part of the things that I do on a day-to-day -day. and the other one that I'll just highlight is uh, a part of which is part of my work as well uh, but an emerging climate action youth network which will really kick off in next year with many local student groups um, in in the community so really looking forward to that as well thanks hi yeah um so before this case, I was part of starting the Fridays for Future movement in Toronto. So we like work to get the message straight to the politicians with protesting and stuff like that. And in the times of COVID, we're mostly online. There are a few events, but we're still very much active. So, yeah. Thank you both. And and yeah, actually, Zoe, I've worked with you before I, I know what you're doing and Shaylin what you're doing sounds incredible so thank you both and uh, this next question goes out to the lawyers so um, this one's for Danielle specifically actually legally speaking what makes this case unique and important yeah thanks Emma that's a great question um, I think we've been seeing at an international level this growing trend of climate litigation throughout the world and especially of those cases starting to win. Um, so courts have been have, have been ordering governments to do more to face the climate crisis. So that's been a really encouraging trend. And there's been this increasing focus on youth led and human rights based cases so that these two trends have really highlighted the way in which climate catastrophe in the future will violate citizens rights if governments don't act now. Um, so we've seen these key legal victories in countries like the Netherlands, Colombia, and Pakistan that have shown that litigation can really play an important role in addressing the climate emergency. Um, so that brings me back to, to here in Canada. So this case is particularly important because it's the first climate case in Canada based on arguments involving constitutionally protected charter rights um, that has made it past a preliminary stage. And as, as Spencer was mentioning earlier, this gives us the opportunity to, to put our important evidence on the serious impacts of climate change in front of a Canadian court um, and show how those impacts will affect things like uh, Ontarians' um, health uh, and their fundamental rights. So, so it's a really important case in that regard. Thank you very much. Um, and, and yeah, I, I agree. Just as an, an outsider, someone who's not, you know, involved in the, the legal world, um, in the news, we see a lot of like court cases like in the Amazon. And so again, it's just so, so interesting to see that reflected in, you know, our own country and, and to follow those 
those cases along. Um, and so this next question is for the lawyers. Again, um, how do you think this case could set a precedent that changes the future of Canadian law? Uh, so, so maybe I'll, I'll start us off. Um, and so in some sense, uh, it already has. The decision is out there. Uh, we hope that other judges read it and follow it in similar cases in the future. Um, and, and the case really is a strong endorsement that climate change is not something that the courts aren't able to touch, that it's something that they have to leave to only elected officials to consider. The court clearly said in our case that where the impacts of climate change affect the legally and constitutionally protected rights of Canadians, the courts have a role to play. So this will have a profound impact on the ability of courts across this country to consider the impacts of climate change on the legal and constitutional rights of Canadians. It's a recognition by the court that governments can't escape scrutiny for their actions or violate the rights of people with impunity simply because the issue is complex or because there may be other actors that are also contributing to the harms. Every government has its role to play, and if not, the courts can and will consider their inaction. And, and maybe just to, to add to that, um, these are very new groundbreaking types of cases. So there's not a lot of decisions already out there that the courts can rely on um, when dealing with this type of case. So every new decision is really important in building the law on how climate change affects Canadians. And we saw this clearly in our motion to strike decision um, where the judge relied on the findings of the courts in the carbon pricing reference cases. Um, and, and this is a, these are uh, cases in which eco-justice lawyers were also involved. Um, and these findings were really helpful for the judge to show that there's a link between government actions, government emissions, and global climate change, as well as the fact that the catastrophic impacts um, that it will have across the country are provable in a court. So, so we've already seen that um, the courts are, are looking at these, these previous decisions in, older, in order to make new findings. So our decision will clearly be relied upon in, in subsequent cases as well. Thank you very much. And, and this specifically is an Ontario based case. So uh, I'm going to ask our applicants um, uh, if you ran into Doug Ford on the street tomorrow and he asked you about this case, you know, what would you say to him? Nonviolent answers only. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can start this one off. Um, I would want to say to Doug Ford that I hope you understand the weight of this case. Uh, you have the ability to impact how the provincial government responds to this case. So you can make history and be on the right side uh, of it with those of us that will be able to tell our grandchildren that we helped make this planet livable for you, or you won't. Um, but you have four daughters that are not much older than me. Uh, if you see the long-term view, we are working to secure their futures as well. I also want to ask, how much time do you think you have? How much time do you think you have before the climate crisis affects you and your family? Probably more time, the more money you make, but that won't matter on the course we're on if you look at the scientific evidence. As a political leader, it's your job to protect all people from harm, and that is our right. Uh, we, have, we all have to do our part, as Danielle said, and I hope you will do yours. Yeah. Um I really don't know what I would say to Doug Ford. If I ran into him, nonviolent answers only, I would probably just say, like, please read up on the science of this. Like, <laughs> please just understand how dire the situation is. And just like what Shaylin said, look your children in the eye and tell them that you're doing the right thing for them. Like, you're not right now. So I don't know. I don't know what I would say to him but something along those lines. Thank you very much. And, and actually, I have a, another question for our applicants. Um, I mean, you talk a lot about, like as activists, um, the science is, is so important to us and, and also our, our communities and, and the people we're fighting for. So this is just a general question uh, so the audience can get to know you a little more. How did you get involved uh, in, in becoming an activist? Uh, how did you, what made you into kind of the, the fighter that you are today? Sure. Um, 
so I've cared about climate change for as long as I can remember, I think. Um, my mom is doing a lot on climate change. She works, uh, she helped start the Fridays for Future movement in Toronto. She helped organize the first rallies. And yeah, just what keeps me taking action is just, well, it, whenever I feel like the pain of seeing like another species go extinct or another forest fire kill this many people, I think, I think like I feel awful, but I have to channel that into doing something or else I feel useless as well. So yeah, that's what keeps me motivated. Um, well, I guess how I became an activist, uh, I started at five years old when I was telling my mom, mom, I want to change the world. She's like, okay, honey. Yeah, that's, that's nice. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've just always been a, a questioning kind of person. Like, why does the world have to be this way? Um, so I went to university and I took indigenous studies and philosophy. And I'm very privileged to have that education. And that led me to start working for nonprofits where I felt like I can really make a difference and engage with the community and um, work with other folks who are uh, also like-minded in that way. So um, that's just propelled me on this path. And I, I really don't take all the credit for it. I, I really have been given so many opportunities by so many people and I'm just so grateful um, also to Creator. Shout out to Creator. Miigwech. Um, and this, I'm going to ask the same question uh, to the lawyers now. What got you involved in, in environmental law and, and on to cases like this? You can start. Um, so I've, I went to law school knowing that I wanted to do something to help change the world, as, as Shailen said, uh, but didn't know exactly, you know, how that would translate into, into action. Um, and I've always had a very keen interest in human rights issues. And throughout law school, um, I started to understand that environmental issues, including climate change, were, were some of the worst um, human rights issues in the world. Um, so that really got me on the track to, to, to uh, looking into environmental issues and seeing what I could do. And, and then ultimately working at EcoJustice. But also prior to that, I, uh, I did a master's degree in environmental law, and I really focused on climate litigation and specifically human rights-based climate litigation. So I had an academic interest um, in these issues before I was, uh, I was allowed to go and put them into practice. So it's been very exciting to, to do that. And so I, I've, I, I practice constitutional law and I've been involved in, in other constitutional cases, charter cases. Um, and I think one of the things that is unique and important about uh, environmental cases and, and this case in particular is, is just the widespread impact uh, of the case and of decisions in the case. Um, we're, we're not just alleging the violation of the rights of a single individual or a small group of people. Climate change will impact the rights of all people in Ontario, all people across Canada. And that's really what this case is about. Um, not just uh, fighting for the protection of the rights of the, the individual applicants, but of all people in Ontario. Thank you very much. And, and I have one last question for everybody. Um, what you know, it's been a, it's been an incredibly difficult year for all of us, and uh, you know the climate science just gets more and more dire, um, and it's more urgent than ever that we act. And, and I know firsthand how hard it can be to to stay motivated and, and to stay fighting. So for all of you, what motivates you to to keep going and, and to keep fighting for your futures and for the futures of others? Um, I guess I can start this one. What keeps me motivated is just the number of people who care like all the people who went to all the climate strikes all around the world thousands and thousands of people it just it makes me hopeful that we can make a difference when so many people are taking action and 
for, for me, honestly, one of the things that, that keeps me going is the incredible applicants that we have in this case, seeing uh, this group of young people so involved um, and willing to fight for uh, to protect their own rights, to protect the rights of their fellow citizens. It, it's truly inspiring to see what they're doing, both in this case and in their uh, activism uh, on climate change in, in all aspects. Yeah, I feel the same as, as Spencer. I think working with Zoe and Shaylin and all the other applicants on the case has been this kind of constant source of motivation uh, for me. Uh, and I'm so inspired by the way that you and Emma and other youth um, have been taking this lead on demanding further climate action, which we we need. Um, so whenever I'm working on something and, and it's, it's a bit complicated or a bit difficult, I, I think back about uh, the youth that I, I'm representing in this case and, and all this, the other young people that can be affected by it. Um, and like Zoe, I like to think back as well to the amazing climate strikes um, that have mobilized hundreds of thousands of people across the country. Um, I attended one in Montreal last year, back when those things were still commonplace, um, and it brought it brought together people of all ages, all backgrounds, and lived experiences who are all united in this this ask for more ambitious action to address climate change. So I try and keep those those highlights in my mind to keep working on this case. Uh, yeah, I also agree with what everyone said that um, this really is the 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 biggest issue of our time. And like, I can't see myself doing anything else. Like I care about this so much. Um, and I really, I have to have hope. Um, but a huge motivation for me as well is the little ones. Uh, so my sisters that are 10 and 12 years old and my nephew that's five years old who lives with me. Um, and like also my future children, like they remind me what I'm fighting for. It's for us, it's for them, it's for all of us. Um, also, you know, this world, this beautiful world that we're a part of with all its diversity. Um, by doing this work, I can help protect this incredible place. So all future generations have the privilege to experience these gifts as I have. So that keeps me motivated. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and I would like to take this time now to, to start to take some questions from the audience and uh, a lot of them have, have come in. So I'm just gonna start. Um, I have one from Logan, which says, could Spencer or Danielle discuss the differences between this case and the La Rose case? And actually that's a question that I'm interested in, in as well, because a lot of my friends are in the La Rose versus Gov case, which is like the, um, it, it seems similar to me, but I'm sure there's a lot of differences. So I, I would like to. Certainly, so uh, maybe I'll get started and, and uh, Danielle, you can jump in uh, as well. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, so the LaRose case is a another uh, case that um, recently had a decision on a motion to strike in the federal court. Uh, and there are certainly some similarities between our case and the LaRose case. So um, both cases are being led by youth and both cases are arguing that the government's inadequate response to addressing climate change is violating the constitutional rights of Canadians. Uh, one big crucial difference uh, between the cases is that the LaRose uh, case is targeting the actions of the federal government, whereas our case is focused on the inactions of the Ontario government and the Ford government. Um, and another big difference is that uh, our case is really aimed squarely at the Ontario government's greenhouse gas reduction target that Danielle was speaking about earlier. Uh, and the LaRose decision or the, the case is a broader attack on kind of the various actions and policies of the federal government across a number of different sectors and areas that are contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. So it was the breadth of the, the focus in the LaRose case that actually led the federal court to uh, strike the case on a motion to strike um, and was one of the reasons why Justice Brown in our case distinguished the cases and allowed our case to proceed, though uh, I, I do understand that the the applicants in the LaRose case are appealing that decision, so uh, hopefully they, they have a more favorable outcome. 
Yeah, I would just uh, add that one other difference between our cases is that um, our case is, is using a procedural uh, vehicle called an application. So we've chosen that because um, we're attempting to get the, court, uh, the, the decision to go through the courts as quickly as possible, given the fact that we're in a climate emergency and, and we now have less than 10 years to, to act on that. Um, so we're trying to, to make procedural uh, decisions that will, will get the case advancing as quickly as possible. Um, and I would just echo what, what Spencer said that that we hope that we, we wish the the, the plaintiffs in, in the LaRose case good luck in, in appealing the decision. We, we know how important it is that that each case uh, move forward on this important issue. Okay, and I have another question from the audience um, from Sophia. Has the government appealed Justice Brown's decision? Um, I'm assuming this is for your lawsuit. Um, and if so, is there a court date scheduled for the appeal? So the, the Ontario government has uh, sought what's called leave to appeal the decision. So the Ontario government actually does not have an automatic right to seek an appeal of the decision. They have to request permission from the Divisional Court of Ontario uh, in order for that court to hear the appeal. So they've sought that permission. Um, and so th there's no date for the appeal yet because right now uh, it will be up to the divisional court to decide whether or not they are willing to hear the appeal of that decision or they will let Justice Brown's decision stand and let the case move forward. Thank you very much. And I have another question from C. Cartman um, to the lawyers. Is there any danger that litigation might push the government to enact legislation counter to environmental conservation, oh, sorry, conservancy slash protection using the notwithstanding clause? I could just quickly quickly mention that you know that this case really addresses the issue of constitutional rights. So so that the idea of whether or not uh, Ontario's target is um, is, is adequate in line with with the science and what we know uh, we need to do in order to to keep global warming below uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. So so they're kind of they're disconnected but connected issues because often when we see that governments don't act on climate change, they can also take other actions on other environmental issues that are unfortunate as well. Um, and maybe I'll just add as well in relation to, to, to the question that if, if we're successful and a court rules that uh, Ontario's current target is unconstitutional, it's leading to the violation of Ontarians' constitutional rights, um, if at that point the government decides that they want to invoke the notwithstanding clause of the Constitution to allow the uh, unconstitutional target to stand, despite the unconstitutional effects that it's having, then that would require the government to go in front of the people of Ontario and say very clearly that uh, we believe that whatever goal it might be, ec economic goals, um, money is, is more important than the constitutional rights of Ontarians. And that's the message that they would be sending by taking an action like that. <laughs> Not to be a little negative. That sounds exactly like Doug Ford's MO. Um, <laughs> okay, so I have one for the applicants um, from Emily. There are some young people out there who have misconceptions about young climate activists or who underestimate you. What do you want those people to know about the power of youth activism? Yeah, I can start. Um, so really, <laughs> From the medicine wheel teachings that I've received, we all have gifts to share at all ages. In the medicine wheel, starting from the east to the north, there are the babies and the children, uh, the youth, young adults like us, and then the adults and the elders or grandparents. And from birth to old age, we always are learners and teachers. And in Indigenous societies generally, the adults spend time with the children parenting. And the uh, parents teach their children a lot, but the babies and children also teach the parents a lot with their innocence and glimpses of wisdom. Um, so generally, also, the youth spend a lot of time with the elders, uh, learning ways of the society. And uh, the elders teach the ways of the people. 
but the job of the youth is to learn, but also ask questions. Uh, I believe as a youth, it is my job to ask questions and to question the way society is set up and the more I learn about it. So the ability to adapt and to um, create new and innovative uh, ways uh, shows the strength in the society. So youth bring so much energy and ideas. And I would argue that that is what our society needs uh, to help solve these issues of our time, especially since we will be affected the most by them. So, um, you know, yeah, that's what I have to say to that. <laughs> um, what I have to say to that is, so Greta Thunberg was just one young person and she sparked a worldwide movement. And I honestly think that uh, older people listen more to youth than other older people. And I think that is because it, well, it used to be strange to see so many young people making noise and protesting. So I honestly think that young people have a very loud voice. And, um, you know, I can add just a little bit to that question too, as a youth activist and, and someone who has also organized big school strikes, I think a lot of our power comes from like how how easily we work together and then how interconnected we are with social media. I know um, when I started in Ontario, we used social media to end school and to get kids to walk out. And we were incredibly successful doing this. And so I think adults really underestimate how connected we are nationally and, and internationally. And um, yeah, it's just, it's really fantastic to see all of this action. Um, and so I have another question for our lawyers. So this one's from Camille. Uh, so this is a ground, Sorry, she says groundbreaking cases with a great deal at stake sometimes end up in the Supreme Court of Canada. Do you think that this might be one of those cases? Uh, so, so maybe I'll start off and um, I guess really the, the best response that I can give to that question is maybe. Um, the Supreme Court, of course, is, is very selective about the cases that it hears, um, though it does tend to be interested in, in cases that uh, raise new issues, cases that are novel, cases that will have impacts across the country, and especially when those cases uh, deal with constitutional rights. So uh, I'll leave it at that, um, but th there would be a number of, of steps um, before we would get to the Supreme Court of Canada, including decisions from various levels of courts in Ontario. Um, and one thing, of course, to keep in mind is that it often takes a, a long time for a case to make it all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, sometimes it could take years. And, and as we know, climate change really is uh, a pressing issue and we need action uh, now. And maybe just to add to what Spencer said, um, if it does make it up to the Supreme Court, uh, there have been key cases on, on issues of societal importance like uh, medically assisted death and, and safe injection sites that have been heard at that level um, regarding constitutional rights. So um, if we do get up to that point, we could expect that that a complex and, and um, important societal issue like this would receive uh, consideration by, by the, the, the judges on the bench there as they have in, in past important cases. Um, thank you very much. And, and this next question um, goes out to, uh, to Shay and Zoe. What have you learned from being a part of this experience? Um, I guess I'll start. Well, I've learned about law. <laughs> I've also learned about how young people can make a difference and how cases like these are really important. And yeah. Yeah, pretty much same. Like I learned so much about law from this firsthand. Um, I learned about uh, the philosophy of law and Indigenous law in university, uh, but being part of one of these history making lawsuits that I learned uh, so much about in school is really surreal. Uh, this case has taught me firsthand about the processes and intricacies of law, which has given me a great respect for lawyers. Uh, uh, yeah, it's also taught me how important it is that we fight for our futures, not only on the streets and in the community, but that we make our voices heard um, in the courts and on a provincial level. And 
with a good precedent coming from this case, uh, it can have a ripple effect into the court, into any court in the world. Um, so this case really taught me the power of law, but also the other major lesson is the power of youth that we have when we share our voices with the world. Thank you very much. And actually, this next question from Erica ties into what you were saying, Shailen. Um, are there any precedences set on the climate crisis that could help this dire case? Thank you. Um, so as I was mentioning earlier, you know, there's not that many cases like this that have, that have been brought before, and and this is the first case of its kind to get past a preliminary motion. So there aren't that many decisions out there that we can draw from that that speak directly to these issues. But one of the key uh, sets of decisions that 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 speak to climate climate action have been the carbon pricing reference cases. So there have been decisions out of the Court of Appeal for Saskatchewan, Ontario, Alberta, and now it is being heard by the Supreme Court of Canada. So those those decisions, while on a separate issue of whether the government has jurisdiction to, to enact its carbon price, um, there have been key findings within those decisions that we've been able to use in our case, such as the fact that you know when governments emit GHG emissions, those affect the global level of, of, of emissions and therefore climate change. Um, and they've also found that in those cases, key evidence was put forward on the impacts of climate change. So in our case, that's something that the judge took into account when she was deciding whether or not the harms that we're alleging in this case are provable, because in a different case, you know, they, they were found to be so. So that is one, one set of decisions we can draw from. And, and I'll just add to that as well. Um, in our arguments, we're also drawing on uh, cases and decisions from outside of Canada, from around the world as well. Um, Danielle mentioned a little bit earlier, there are there are cases out of uh, the Netherlands, out of the Dutch Supreme Court, out of Colombia, Pakistan, uh, England, Australia, um, virtually, courts in virtually every continent, I think with the, the only exception of Antarctica, uh, have been starting to consider climate change and and it's quite clear from all of these decisions that uh, climate change is something that the courts can look at and that was uh, a very important issue on the motion to strike decision and um thank you very much and we have a really interesting question from howard um how has indigenous knowledge um contributed sorry contributed to the applicant's legal strategy And anyone can answer this one. Maybe I could just briefly mention that that you know, as we noted before, um, indigenous peoples are, are on the front lines of climate change. Um, they will be disproportionately affected by it. So um, we, some of the allegations that we've put forward have have touched upon um, those those disproportionate impacts, including on indigenous communities in Ontario. Um, especially those in the far north where climate change is occurring at a much faster pace. Um, so we're hoping to put forward evidence to, to support um, those harms that have that have already occurred and will certainly continue to occur um, with future climate change. I also just want to add that that was a big part of uh, my affidavit and I'm sure the affidavit of Shelby and BG so that definitely is um, within the, the case. Thank you very much. And we have time for just one more question. And this one is coming from Karen. What do you think are the most important things for the rest of us to do to stop climate change? And uh, anyone can answer this one. Um. I, I could answer this one. Well, it's kind of hard in COVID, but mainly protesting and telling governments that what they're doing is not okay or what they're doing is great or thank you for doing that or please don't do that and stuff like that. Just governments have power, and but they listen a lot to what people say. So if something really outrages you, you should like write a letter, uh, tell your friends, spread the word about climate change. Another thing you can do is get informed and help inform others about it. 
and just talk about climate change. Talking about climate change will remind people of how important it is and how many people's lives will be affected by it. So yeah, there's a lot you can do. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, educating yourself and lobbying politicians and government, definitely. Um, I also don't want to give them that much power, although they have a lot of power. Um, I also feel like, you know, um, the people have a lot of power and um, we can do things in whatever uh, area you're in, like everyone has a gift to bring to this fight. And, um, you know, climate change is such an interconnected issue with so many other issues. So um, that's part of the education is educating yourself on that. Like you'll see the slogan, indigenous sovereignty is climate action. And I encourage you to go look that up if you haven't heard it yet. Um, but yeah, like, just do something in whatever way that you can, whether you're, you know, a nurse and talking to your uh, people about getting, you know, recyclable things. I don't know if that's a good example, but, you know, that's just maybe one. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I think that, that's a great question. And, and it's good to remind ourselves that, you know, climate litigation is an important piece of, of how we can act in order to address the climate crisis, but it certainly isn't the only one. We need actions on all fronts um, from everyone in, in their capacity. And so, uh, as Zoe was saying, you know, try try to raise your own voice, but you can also amplify the voice of others who, who, who are communicating about these things. So, um, if you're at all interested in, in, um, in following our case, you know, you can always sign up for email updates, for instance, to, to know how the case is going and to amplify the voice of the, the applicants on this case. But there's so many other voices out there that are worth being heard as well. And I'll, I'll just echo what, what everyone has just said. I, I agree with all of it as well. And I'll maybe add one more piece that um, for those of us who are old enough to vote and are able to vote, um we should vote use our votes on behalf of those who don't yet have that option who uh are are you know that like the youth like many of the youth in this case uh who don't yet have the ability to vote but will be the most impacted by uh the government's decisions and inaction on climate change um and so it's important to uh to make action on climate change a a key um, a key aspect of of who you're voting for and then even beyond elections push those governments to to take action and take more action um, because if if the government had instituted an adequate scientifically based greenhouse gas emissions reduction target we wouldn't need to be here um, and it's because of the government's inaction that we have had to go to the courts to try and get them to respect the constitutional rights of Ontarians. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll just add my piece to that too. Um, uh, you know, we hear a lot that climate change is like an individual issue. Like it's all about the small changes you can make in your own life, uh, like choosing more sustainable options. But I mean, I think one of the most important things we can be doing is is to kind of shift that blame from an individual issue to people and, and corporations who are, um, you know, contributing so much more to the climate crisis than an individual ever could. And part of that is showing up for frontline communities who are taking on these uh, these corporations head on. And, and part of that is, is suing governments and pushing for action um, through climate strikes and it's just so incredible to see all these different facets of activism coming together in something like this lawsuit. So thank you everyone for, for your actions and your time and your participation. Thanks. You're muted. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks, Emma. Um, 
And I want to thank all of uh, our speakers today and for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom, um, for giving us this opportunity to get to know you better as well, and for inspiring us with your passion for this work. And I want to thank everyone who's joined the call uh, as well. I know you're here because you're also caring and passionate people, and your presence inspires, uh, I think it's fair to speak say that it inspires these young climate activists, it inspires our legal team and all of us here at EcoJustice. Um, if you did miss part of today's conversation or you'd like to share it with a friend, uh, we'll be sending a video link by email. Uh, so watch out for that. It'll probably land in your inbox in a day or two. Um, and in closing, I'd like to emphasize that here at EcoJustice, you know, we've heard uh, from the lawyers, uh, Danielle and Spencer both test, uh, touched on this, but we know from experience that the law is one of the most direct and most powerful tools we have for building the case for a better earth. And that going to court is often the only way to ensure people in the environment are protected by the full weight of the law. And as Canadians, um, we have the right to have a voice in environmental matters that uh, impact us. Um, you know, cost and time and expertise can prohibit people's full participation. And, and that's why EcoJustice exists. And we represent every one of our clients free of charge. Um, we're Canada's largest environmental char uh, law charity. We're 100% donor funded, and we're proud to be supported by organizations and by people like you, people who share our values and vision of a thriving environment, a safe climate, and healthy communities. And this brings us to the end of our final online conversation for 2020. Um, again, I wanna thank you for your support and for all that you do um, in this fight for a safer, healthier environmental future. Um, wanna wish you all a wonderful evening. Uh, stay safe and please take care of one another.